Hello, and thanks for tuning in to the first installment of the Grow Native webinar series taking place on Wednesday afternoons throughout the month of June. My name is Felicia Ammon. I am the Outreach and Education Coordinator for the Missouri Prairie Foundation. Uh, for our first talk in this series, we are going to be hearing from Scott Woodbury, manager of the Whitmire Wildflower Garden at Shaw Nature Reserve and Grow Native Advisor on balancing maintenance and diversity using native plant landscaping practices. Scott Woodbury is the manager of the Whitmire Wildflower Garden at Shaw Nature Reserve, where he has been developing the garden for 29 years. Scott spends much time speaking, writing, and consulting throughout the region on native landscape planning. He received a BS degree in horticulture at the University of Wisconsin, Madison, and has worked at various public gardens, including Old Westbury Gardens in New York, Longwood Gardens in Pennsylvania, Castello di Uzano in Italy, and Tudor Place in Washington, DC. Uh, he currently serves in his, as an advisor to the horticulture program of St. Louis Community College at Merrimack, Grow Native, and Wild Ones St. Louis. Scott also volunteers for Ozark Land, Regional Land Trust and serves on the planning committees of the Partners for Native Landscaping Annual Conference, as well as the Shaw Professional Landscaping Series held at Albarisi. Be sure to check out the rest of the Grow Native webinar series throughout June. We'll have three more presentations after this. Um, and now I'm going to turn it over to Scott. Thanks, Felicia. Um, sorry, everybody, you can't see my face. Uh, this is the ghost of Scott Woodbury, and um, I'm going to try to do this talk standing on my hands, upside down, and um, we'll see how that goes. I wish that all of you could be sitting in front of me because uh, this is uh, this is an awfully strange time to be uh, uh, doing this looking at a computer, and I miss everybody so much. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, you will be able to come to Shaw Nature Reserve shortly. The, the Nature Reserve will be opening to the public on uh, June 16. Uh, if you're a Missouri Botanical Garden member, you can come a week early, which is awesome. Uh, it's a good reason to become a member if you were thinking about it. And uh, I can't wait to see you when you come out. Um, I am gonna be talking about uh, maintenance in gardens. And um, whenever I talk about maintenance, I always, think about um, what does it take to maintain a garden. And so I'm not just going to be talking about maintenance practices. I'm also going to be talking about uh, balancing uh, your workload, your, your, your maintenance workload, the, the things that you do in the garden with the time that you have. So I'll be spending quite a bit of time talking about those things. The best gardens um, can fail uh, completely fail, they can, they can fall flat if one thing is missing, and that is maintenance. You can um, have all the best resources at your fingertips, like um, this maintenance guide that we have at the Shaw Nature Reserve website. You can go there and look for the Native Landscape Maintenance Schedule, uh, get a lot of details there. Uh, you can also find lots of uh, handouts where uh, plant Plant lists and plant material um, suggestions are at your fingertips for free on our website. Um, there are a lot of books that you can read. You can go to the Grow Native website and pull, pull down, I don't know how many, a couple dozen lists of, of Grow, Na Grow Native top 10 lists for all sorts of different situations. You can um, design a perfect garden. You can uh, have it all laid out just right with all the right plants and it can still fail if maintenance falls through the cracks. Um, do take a moment to go to the Grow Native website and look at, um, look at the landscape designs that are there. Uh, there are some that are new and they're uh, full of color like this one. Um, and there's some older ones that I know are going to be updated um, in the coming months and years. Uh, gardens can be prepared perfectly, ever so uh, tenderly and all the weeds removed and everything tilled up like you see here at the beginning of the um, Sierra Club garden uh, a few years back. And it can be planted just right, you know, the green stuff up and the brown stuff down. 
uh, and and even so, it all falls apart if you don't have people uh, there to, to tend the garden and care for it. So that's what this talk is going to be about. I really want to stress um, the importance of people, uh, the importance of people showing up in person. Um, I know the Sierra Club Garden uh, has, has a great group of volunteers that help, uh, and you'll see a picture of them a little bit later. Um, let me start by talking about talking about lawn maintenance. Um, we should talk about lawns because lawns are a part of our lives. That's a part of my life. Uh, we have lawn and we have a 13 year old who uses that lawn on a regular basis. This is not a 13 year old, but uh, that's a younger version of our 13 year old. Um, and so lawns are, are important. Um, here's a close up picture of my lawn. Um, when I think about maintenance, in my lawn, I think about two things. I think about the diversity of weeds that are in it, which are important. Um, and I also think about the height that I'm mowing it and the intervals between mows. So I try to get the, mow, the mowing um, intervals um, spaced out as far as I can, as far as I can manage. Um, I try to cut the grass between three and four inches high. When I do that, I get weeds that bloom in between mows. And you can see in this picture that some of the weeds are violets, which are native. And so that's one way that you can increase diversity. It's uh, by, by encouraging some weeds to flower and that benefits the bees that come to your garden. Um, balance between garden and turf is, is something that we all need to think about. Um, those of us who have turf grass anyway. Um, you have to think about um, what your capacity is as a gardener um, because it's a lot easier cutting grass than it is to maintain a garden. And I'll, I'll give a lot of examples of what I mean by that. Uh, this first example is a garden that um, uh, was one of the most wonderful gardens in St. Louis for many years. Uh, this garden started out as a turf grass lawn and the homeowner moved in and his goal was to sell his lawnmower in a yard sale. And he did. Um, so you have this really beautiful landscape um, full of native plants. Um, I like the humor here with the prickly pear cactus by the, by the mailbox. I'm sure the mailman got a kick out of that. But what oftentimes happens when you, you, you don't have a balance of turf grass to garden is that um, you may end up selling your, your property for some reason, and then it can end up looking like this. Uh, this is the after picture, believe it or not. This is probably what the garden looked like before the guy bought it, but it's what the garden looked like after it was sold. He couldn't find a buyer. He couldn't find anybody who had the capacity to garden like he did. And um, a garden, a yard full of native plants takes time to care for it. So one of the strategies that, um, that we use as gardeners, as native landscapers, is to utilize low diversity. Now, low diversity means low maintenance. Uh, the fewer plant species you have in a garden, uh, the fewer complexities there are involved in maintaining it. So I oftentimes see landscapes like this in, in commercial settings like this, uh, this rain garden on South Grand. Species diversity is really low. It makes it easier to maintain. Um, unfortunately, I see a lot of this too. Um, ground covers um, basically are very low uh, maintenance landscapes. They're also very low diversity landscapes, unfortunately. Um, and there are a no number of invasive uh, plants that are being used or have been used as ground covers like English ivy and winter creeper euonymus. Periwinkle is also showing up in the wild landscape and in becoming an invasive plant. So um, just to give you some idea, there are evergreen alternatives for English ivy and winter creeper euonymus, um, golden groundsels, which is Senecia aureus, which is now called Pacara aureus, uh, is a plant that works very nicely. Um, it is evergreen. It, it stays green all winter long, just like English ivy but it has the added attraction of blooming in, um, in late April. This is what it, it, is, it looked like in spring. Uh, right now the, the flowers are all finished and we are trimming back the tops. Um, and then for the rest of the year, it's gonna look like this again. 
Um, Pennsylvania sedge is a plant that, uh, that we've used successfully as a ground cover. Um, and it's almost like a turf alternative. Uh, you can see my feet um, in this Pennsylvania sedge planting that we mow twice a year. <clears throat> so think of a lawn that, that you only have to mow twice. Uh, we mow it in February because it starts growing in March, and then we mow it again in uh, late July, early August, because it has sort of a tired period in the middle of summer. It's not terribly um, tired looking or ugly looking, but it's something that we do trim back. And this is what it looked like two weeks after cutting it back. I wouldn't say that this is a turf alternative, but I would say that it, it looks kind of turf-like. Uh, the beauty of sedges like this is that they can be mowed with a lawnmower or with a string trimmer, um, and that makes it super easy. Now I've seen a lot of um, prairie drop seed plantings. Now those drumstick alliums are not native, but, um, but the prairie drop seed is. Um, it, the problem with the prairie drop seed ground cover is that they produce these, um, these woody stems that come out of the ground. Um, and you, you, you can't drive over this with a lawnmower. Uh, so you're either gonna have to cut it back with a string trimmer or cut it back by hand. All right, so let's talk about small size because small size matters. Um, small size, typically means lower diversity. There's a little bit of diversity, but it's lower diversity. Um, and it also gives you low maintenance. If you have a landscape that's a couple hundred square feet in size, uh, then it's, it's manageable. It's, even for somebody who is extremely busy, um, who perhaps has very little capacity to garden. So small gardens like these work really well to reduce maintenance. Um, it also is easier to maintain because uh, there are just a few perennials in this particular landscape um, and one small flowering tree, in this case a rusty black hog viburnum that needs to be pruned usually once um, in the winter and uh, maybe a little bit of trimming in June if the branches come out over the sidewalk. So small size um, means lower maintenance and it's a good place to start if you're a beginning gardener. Large size, however, uh, gardens that are bigger um, definitely take more maintenance. Um, you have more space to care for, more square footage. You have um, more plants that interact with one another. And um, if you want to maintain a traditional look, and that's what we're talking about right now is traditional garden looks. Um, we're looking at the garden in the, at the bottom of the screen, not the garden at the top of the screen. Um, that landscape takes a, quite a bit of maintenance to care for. Um, in fact, it takes about 12 minutes per square foot per year to maintain that garden. Um, and for in this case, a thousand square feet of garden uh, takes about four hours a week to maintain. And so, um, so those numbers will mean something a little later in the talk and we'll look at some various gardens to, um, to compare that to. Um, Here's a garden that's very complex. There's a lot of diversity here. There are lots of native plants, um, but there's also non-native plants. You can see the zinnias and the petunias. Um, and if we think about the research that Doug Tallamy's done, uh, Doug Tallamy's an entomologist that works at the University of Delaware, who's done a lot of research on native versus non-native plants. We know that 70% native plants is the magic number to meet in your garden. If you have 70% native plants and 30% or less non-native plants, you are gonna be benefiting birds, especially birds that are nesting in your neighborhood, in your yard. And so we need to look to that 70% threshold um, to have successful gardens um, for birds and wildlife. Um, obviously bigger gardens um, means more plant diversity, higher plant diversity um, equals high wildlife diversity. And, um, and also a lot more maintenance. This is a very, very intensive garden to maintain. All right, switching gears slightly, I wanna talk a little bit about, um, about plant material. Um, I showed you some resources at the beginning of the talk um, about where you can find um, lists of plants that can be helpful. 
Um, the Native Landscape Guide, Chapter 4, Landscaping with Native Plants, is something that you can find um, at our visitor center for sale. If you want a paper copy, you can go online and find um, a, a, a PDF version of it. And in the back of it, there's lots of lists of plants that are useful, kind of like top 10 lists, but expanded top 10 lists. Um, and one of, the, one of the popular lists in there is a list of plants um, that are um, resistant to deer. Now, not all plants are completely resistant to deer, so take that with a grain of salt. This is basically three years of, of our research um, on private property in, in St. Louis County. Mulching. I want to talk briefly about brown mulch and then I want to talk about green mulch. Um, brown mulch is the stuff that we buy. Um, maybe it's uh, the stuff that you get out of your compost pile, I don't know, um, but usually we buy it. Um, this is shredded bark mulch in this example. Um, and when we apply brown mulch every year, sometimes we have to apply it twice a year. Uh, it requires a considerable amount of time and backbreaking labor to get that mulch down. Um, this is a, a traditional practice that um, the gardeners have been using for many, many decades. Um, you know those mulch gardens that you've seen at grocery stores and mini malls where there's more mulch than there are plants, sometimes no plants at all. Uh, those are Those are kind of those are pretty pitiful landscapes um, that require a lot of remulching every single year. Um, there's nothing wrong with mulching. Um, that's, uh, that's one style of gardening that, that people have been doing for a long time. That style of garden, however, um, is, um, is changing and people are starting to realize the benefits of, of this style of mulching. Um, and this is a this is something where you leave, keep the leaf litter laying on the ground or choose where you want to have leaf litter. Um, I would encourage you to think about places in your landscape where you can keep leaf litter sitting on the ground because there are a whole host of insects that overwinter in leaf litter. And if you rake up all your leaf litter, replace it with mulch, then you are raking up all kinds of moth, um, butterfly, um, uh, lots of different species of insects that I don't even know the names of. So if you can find places where you can keep leaf litter on the ground, you're going to be benefiting wildlife and you're going to be reducing the amount of mulch that you are going to have to purchase and put down on the ground. Now you need to be careful doing this because um, some municipalities might think that this is a neglectful landscape. So you have to do certain things to make, um, to make your garden look like it's tended. Um, and we'll talk about some of those things uh, shortly. Uh, another gardening practice that, um, that we're starting to see come to fruition right now is this practice of, um, in the winter time, trimming back stems to 14 inches in height, 12, 14 inches in height. Um, when you cut stems high, what happens is uh, solitary bees come in and drill holes in the stems and you can see this little bee that's drilling a hole in Monarda um, fistulosa. It's a very tiny stem but it's a really tiny bee and it's, it's burying its eggs down in there. Uh, here's another one. This is a sumac stem and you can see a bee that is looking back out at us through this little hole. Um, and so leaving stems cut high encourages bees to lay eggs in stems which really does help um, solitary bee populations. Bees are the, one of the biggest pollinators in our garden and we need to be thinking about habitat for bees if we're gonna have healthy um, gardens that are full of the greatest diversity of wildflowers. Uh, this is kind of what it can look like um, when your stems are cut 12 to 14 inches high. It looks a little bit messy for, um, for a, a month or so in late winter um, but usually by the second week of April, there's green growth that's, that's shooting up all around these stems and the stems tend to get hidden pretty quickly. Um, some plants that we tend to encourage, um, some plants that stand up strongly, um, some plants flop over and those don't make a very good plant for, um, for trimming high, but bergamot, goldenrod, coneflower, 
tall coreopsis, New England aster, any aster, iron weeds, Joe Pye weeds, and cup plants make really great um, habitat for bees. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about green mulch. So green mulch is uh, maybe a new concept. Green mulch is basically not adding any mulch at all. Um, this is the upper woodland in the Whitmer Wildflower Garden where um, plants are growing so thickly that um, they're eliminating most of the weeds. So they're doing a really good job of crowding out weeds. When you look in there very closely, you'll notice that all of the space between plants is filled with something. Um, in this case, the filler is, uh, is common violet. Um, we think of violets, or maybe we have thought of violets in the past as being weeds in our gardens, but uh, these are actually the plants that are creating huge amount of benefit by filling space. And so they're working really well um, as a green mulch. Uh, how do we create these gardens? Um, this is a slide showing a design plant community that we um, started planting in the fall last year. Um, um, John Steele, one of our horticulture staff at Shaw Nature Reserve, started planting in um, last fall. You can see how he's doing it in this grid pattern. Um, it's, it's a really nifty um, system because we have a tool that Gary Schimmelfenig made um, out of metal that becomes a dibble that is the exact same size as the plug that we're installing. And so these plugs are pretty small and the planting goes extremely fast. Now the advantage to doing this is that um, you, you end up putting plants in the ground very close together. Um, about seven inches apart is, the, is about as close as we think that you can do it without, um, without causing damage when you're doing the installation. So here's a, a grid with 30 plugs. Um, and then you can work out the, the species that are going into those plugs and each of your um, squares in the grid can be different or they can be the same. And you can design it any way you want. Um, another one of the beauties here is that um, you can work on, you can start at one edge of your planting and work backwards without stepping on any plants. And then everything is perfectly evenly spaced out, as you can see in this slide. I'm going to get a drink of water here. All right, so this is what it looked like in the spring this year. This is what it looks like right now. There's a few weeds in there. Uh, there's no, there aren't any big weeds that we're really worried about. You can see all of the plants spaced out in there. Um, and uh, we are hoping that this um, design plant community will mature and fill out um, in a two year period. During the two year period, um, we um, are applying mulch, brown mulch. You can see the brown mulch in between um, the plants there that really goes a long way toward eliminating a, some of the weeds or a lot of the weeds. Um, so right after we put the plugs in, we sprinkle a very light layer of brown mulch. Um, and we might sprinkle a little more brown mulch next spring, but that'll be the last time we mulch this, um, this garden. Um, when these gardens fill out, um, they can look something like this. Uh, this is a kind of a design plant community that was done in a small scale. Um, you get higher diversity with gardens like this, which means you have um, higher diversity of um, insects that visit it and birds that use it to, to eat the insects. But you typically get lower maintenance also because plants are so closely spaced. If you look at this um, slide at the Prairie Garden Trust, uh, I love the Prairie Garden Trust. You should um, schedule a visit sometime. I don't know if they're open yet or not, but um, awesome garden. Uh, here's a 45,000, 4,500 4, 4, square foot um, design plant community where um, you can see that um, at three minutes per square foot, the maintenance is much lower than in a traditional garden. Uh, remember, in a traditional garden, the, the maintenance was about 12 minutes per square foot. <clears throat> and so that's um, a significant increase in maintenance. Um, now, remember, I showed you this image of a, a garden design that's on the Grow Native website. Uh, this is a pretty small garden. It's under 200 square feet. Um, it's a traditional arrangement of plants. Um, so it's not a design plant community, but it's um, sort of traditional masses of plants, groupings of plants. 
and see that 12 minute per square foot um, maintenance, it, it basically works out to a little over an hour a week um, to maintain that roughly 200 square feet. If we go back and look at this, um, seven hours a week for 4,500 square feet, um, if you do, you do the math, which I did, it turns out to be quite a bit less um, maintenance. Uh, more diversity too, because it's a bigger garden with more species diversity. But if you look at this, you'll see a lot of species diversity. There's 14 species of plants in this um, grow native design. In a mowed lawn, I just thought I'd throw this out. This is why a lot of people use lawn. Um, it takes about 15 seconds per square foot to maintain a mowed lawn. It is a very inexpensive, um, I mean, once you get the, gar the, the thing installed, it's a very inexpensive way to maintain a gar uh, space around your house. Um, I'm not promoting lawns all around people's houses. We have way too much lawn. Doug Tallamy tells us that we've got over 40 million square uh, miles of mowed grass in North America or in the, in the United States, and that that's more um, area than we have national parks. So uh, I think we should work toward trying to reduce the amount of, um, of turf in our landscapes. Um, but remember um, that there may be a use for uh, turf grass um, in your landscape and don't, don't get rid of all of it right away because you could get in trouble. Um, okay, so things that I want you to think about. Um, how much time do you have as a gardener? Um, if you have all the time in the world, then go for it. Um, do more than 200 square feet of garden. If you're a little nervous and you don't quite know how much um, garden you can manage, then start small. Start with a 200 square foot garden and go from there. Grow it out from there. Um, how much energy do you have? Um, I, I know that this person is a friend of mine, has tons of energy, and so she's got tons of garden space. Um, but not everybody has the same level of energy. And so you need to take that into consideration, ask that question to yourself and try to be honest. Um, how much experience do you have? Um, know when you don't have all the experience that you need and find experts who can come and help you. Um, expert horticulture is, is priceless. And so if you need help, um, seek it out. And uh, one uh, other great place to find help is through uh, a group called Wild Ones. Um, Wild Ones is a, a nation nationwide organization. Uh, there's a chapter in St. Louis. Um, there are chapters elsewhere um, across the Midwest, and they are a great resource um, to help you um, discover how to garden with native plants. Um, how much help do you have? That's another thing that I, I think you should think about as you're com contemplating maintenance. Um, if you're working in a community garden or if you're um, developing a space at home, um, do you have friends um, or neighbors that can help you do this? Do you have family that can come over and help you um, weed and, and create a, a garden space? Um, I would encourage you to check out the Sierra Club um, office, uh, the garden at the Sierra Club office in St. Louis in Maplewood um, to, to see a, a garden that is the right size for the group of people that are maintaining it. And the secret to maintenance, maintenance is just that. If you have balance between the team of people that you have working in the garden and the size and style of the garden, you will have success. Um, I see a lot of gardens that don't have enough help on one hand and way too many uh, things to do and way too big of a garden on the other hand and the garden tends to suffer and sometimes fail as a result. Uh, last thing I wanna, last question I wanna ask is how much money do you have? Now, um, I'm thinking more about communities and on South Grand, the South Grand um, Community Improvement District doesn't have all the money in the world um, and, but they've created a solution that, that, that is working toward having great gardens. And so they, there's a partnership between um, a, a landscape contractor, a small landscape contractor, uh, Pretty City, and a nonprofit um, a group called Eco Landscaping. And, um, and so Angie Weber runs Eco Landscaping, and she is basically contracted to come and maintain a group of volunteers who can assist 
pretty city in the care of this garden. So how much money do you have? If you don't have enough money to make your community garden work, um, there are ways that you can, there are creative ways that you can um, find the help to make the garden great and successful. Uh, so finally, I just wanna mention uh, one, one more resource um, before I take some questions. Um, we, have not been able to do native plant school um, through June, and I'm really sad about that, but I'm excited to say that we are gonna be moving forward with our council ring conservation, I'm sorry, conversation series. And you can see the dates. Um, we've got four exciting um, uh, conversation series uh, events that are lined up. The first one on July 9 is Cedar Prairie in Savannah. Uh, we have John Wingo, Simon Barker, and Mervyn Wallace that are going to be attending to, um, to join in on the conversation. Um, I'm going to jump to my next slide here and then keep talking. Obviously, we can't have this many people um, for safety reasons. So we are going to be um, being as safe as we can, uh, maintaining social distancing for this event. It's going to be an outdoor conversation that will happen this, in this council ring. Um, and we can only take 20 people to be safe. Um, but please come, um, be early in signing up because uh, 20 spaces will go very quickly. Um, and um, I welcome you. I look forward to seeing all of you. And um, I think that we can, uh, I'll leave this slide up for just a, a few more seconds so you can um, write down those dates if you want to try to attend. These are all in St. Louis. They're all in the Whitmire Wildflower Garden at Shaw Nature Reserve. You can register online at Missouri Botanical Garden um, and in the class uh, registration. Uh, so that's my talk. Uh, thanks for listening. I'm gonna get off of my hands and sit up right here and answer some questions. Thank you, Scott. This is Carol David. I'm the Executive Director of the Missouri Prairie Foundation. And thank you, Scott, that was wonderful. There are a number of questions. Can you hear me okay, Scott? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, um, uh, several uh, questions about voles. Voles keep eating the roots of my plants. Are traps the only way to take care of them? How can I save my plant roots from moles? Um, voles, excuse me, voles. With yeah, meat. from voles. Uh, that's a really good question. Um, I think about voles all the time because we have plenty of voles in our garden. Um, first of all, uh, let me say that voles are a native prairie species. They, they belong in our landscape. They're not an invasive mammal. Um, they are something that we, um, we don't dislike in our garden. The way that we garden with voles is by planting more of the things that they like. Um, one of their favorite foods is blazing star. There's no way that we will ever have a blazing star demonstration in our garden if we're not planting or replanting blazing star every other year. Um, we bring in new blazing stars. Um, I, that is the solution that we've, um, that we've decided to go with. Uh, we will not try to um, discourage voles. Um, we're not necessarily encouraging them. We happen to have really healthy populations of snakes in our garden, which put pressure on voles. And we also have a lot of hawks um, at Shaw Nature Reserve, and they're constantly eating small mammals as well. Great. Several questions on cutting back perennials for nesting bees, and um, you address this, and I wanted to, if I may, just jump in, and this might help people. Um, tomorrow, Felicia is going to send out an email to everybody who registered with all of the um, links that we've shared and any others that Scott might want us to share, and there's also a really nice new graphic that Heather Holmes, who's an author on bees, just created that's really helpful for showing um, the development of bees in the stems, when to cut them. And I know people have different ideas about when to cut them, um, but the graphic shows anywhere between eight to 22 inches tall. Scott, I think you said maybe 14 was your recommendation. Yeah, my recommendation is what can you tolerate? Um, if your threshold is eight inches, then great, go eight inches. If you can go a little bit taller, um, maybe go 12, 14. Um, if you can go taller than that, that's fine. Um, 
James Fapel dug into a stem one time, and I think he said that he saw eggs down in the stem um, as far as eight inches. And so um, minimum of eight inches, I would say. Okay, great. So um, we'll send that out, but the, just the graphic will show to, to just leave all the plants up during the winter and then in the spring, cut the stems and then leave those cut through the growing season because they're nesting in there and then they take a year usually to fulfill their life cycle. Um, yeah. And I would like to comment on that. Um, I wouldn't leave everything in your garden standing because some things flop over immediately and they're not going to be utilized by bees anyway. So if it's something that's flopping over um, really quickly at the end of the winter, early spring, I would say remove those stems because they're probably not going to do any good anyway. Very, very good. Thank you. Um, a question on um, using green mulch, you know, the, the, the concept of green mulch. What about at the, at the end of the season, if you have maybe more uh, sort of dead vegetation than you want, uh, as it kind of goes along with the with the stem question. Um, like, what do you if, you, if you have really tall plants, will you end up with rotting mounds of foliage and flowers that can rot out uh, plant crowns? Or would you cut it down in layers so you have shorter pieces of dead plants? Well, um, the, the things that we're doing in the wildflower garden are are different, uh, different things. Uh, first of all, um, in the woodland areas, we some years keep the leaf litter from the trees laying on the ground and uh, we cut the stems back at, um, at around 12 to 14 inches high. And, um, and then all of the dead leaf tissue that is laying on the ground um, yeah. is the mulch. Uh, it's actually the mulch that, um, that, that covers the ground and prevents weeds from getting established. And, um, so, so I'm not too worried about um, uh, buildup of organic matter in a woodland setting. I know that in a prairie setting, uh, there is com some concern about having um, the buildup of thatch. Now, I, th I see that conversation happening in the, in the, um, the context of a, a prairie restoration, of ecological restoration. Um, and that may be a concern if you have a large scale um, seeded um, green mulch prairie. But most, uh, most homeowners are, are, are creating some spaces that are small um, in the yard. And um, what I would recommend is, is every three to five years, um, cutting that vegetation down and, and removing some of the thatch that may build up, especially when you have a lot of grasses. If you can get away with burning it, then you get away with burning it. But don't do that um, anywhere near a building, especially a vinyl-sided building, because vinyl has a very, very low melting point. Great. Another question similar to uh, cutting uh, the theme of cutting plants back. Can I cut liatris back now to retard blooming time? And can I cut my coneflowers back by one third to extend bloom time? So um, I don't cut coneflowers or blazing stars ever. Um, my recommendations on trimming back plants in the last week of April and the first week of May it's a recommendation for late summer and fall blooming plants. Uh, things that bloom in, in summer, um, if you cut them back, they, they us you're usually removing so much of the stem material that, that it doesn't have enough energy to come back and flower very well. So we, we never cut back spring and summer blooming plants. We only cut back um, late summer and fall blooming plants. Things like rose turtle head, asters, goldenrod, ironweed, sunflowers, those are all plants that bloom at the very end of summer and into fall. Um, and so, yeah, no, no cutting back of any blazing stars um, and we never cut back um, cone flowers. Yeah, well, maybe with the exception of um, uh, Rudbeckia laciniata, which is um, golden glow, which is a seven foot tall um, Black-eyed Susan that grows in river bottoms. It, it gets pretty tall. It blooms late in summer. That's the exception. Um, and you could probably cut that one back. Great, thank you. Michelle asks, how can you get the leaves and debris to stay in high wind areas? 
Well, if you have um, stems standing, they will stay. If you have um, mowed lawn, if you think about what happens in a typical lawn situation, the leaves just blow away and they roll across the lawn and find either a low depression or something um, to lean against. So we found that in our woodland um, green mulch areas, the leaves that come down stay put and they don't move because there are lots of stems that are sitting there to, to capture the leaves and that keep them in place. Good point. Um, Honey asks, what is the best way to get rid of unwanted plants in a larger garden without using damaging chemicals? Um, so different ways to, to deal with that. If you are wanting to convert an entire section or a large area, you can solarize the soil uh, using, um, I'm using a big piece of old um, rubber liner that was an old pond liner that had some holes in it. It's really heavy and um, I put it on the ground and it doesn't blow away because it's got some weight to it. Um, other ways to solarize, um, I don't like using plastic, but a lot of people use plastic, that's fine. Um, but I do like using, um, um, mowing the vegetation down low and then covering the ground with either um, three layers of newspaper or pieces of cardboard and then covering that with mulch. And the reason I like going that way is, uh, even though it's a little more effort than pinning plastic down, um, you, you still encourage all of the critters in the soil worms and I don't even know what critters live in the soil. <laughs> Microorganisms that live in there are still active and um, they're um, working toward decaying um, the roots and leaves that, um, that are underneath that mulch layer. Um, I know a lot of people use plastic to solarize. Um, it, it, it must be working because so many people are using it. I would recommend doing that for six weeks before you do any planting. It takes six weeks for the plants to die and the roots to start to rot. Um, yeah, that was just part of the answer. The other part is if you've got a lot of weeds mixed between your, your plants, the, your intentional plants, um, then you have a lot of weeding to do. It's, uh, it's just a, um, unfortunate, um, an unfortunate reality in, in gardens. Thank you. Uh, Sherry Ann asks, if I trim back Linocerus and Perverins, the coral honeysuckle, will I be taking away future seeds that birds might eat? Well, um, that species does not produce a, an abundance of fruits. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't be too worried about it. If you were, um, and the other thing is, um, I find that the honeysuckles get eaten by the squirrels before they get eaten by the birds. Um, so, there's another species, limber honeysuckle, uh, which is Lonicera uh, dioica, which I know Missouri Wildflowers Nursery is um, uh, using now or selling now. And it's a heavy fruiter. Uh, it produces lots of berries, um, which I think is wonderful. Um, it's a showy um, part of the plant. But as soon as the berries appear, the squirrels are all over it. And um, uh, maybe some birds get in on some of the action, but it's usually squirrels that eat those things. Um, so I think if you're cutting back your honeysuckle with fruits on it, you're missing out on, on one of the showiest parts of the plant. And I would just wait and cut it back after it's done fruiting. Thank you. Um, another question on green mulch, and maybe we should um, clarify. Um, so Val asked, the large area of, of North uh, of New England aster or other taller plant, if you leave three feet of cut green mulch, if you cut all at once, isn't this too much to leave on top of those nice stems you are leaving? I, maybe, I, maybe there's a little bit of confusion here about what yeah. we, you mean by green mulch. Maybe you could talk about that some more. Oh yeah, so when we cut, um, when, when we make those cuts um, to remove the old vegetation, we remove the tops and we put them in the compost pile. And so, um, so they, they don't add to, um, to the ground layer. That's, what, that's our practice in the garden. However, I will say that the, um, the Lurie Garden in Chicago um, is essentially a green mulch garden. Um, they don't mulch with brown mulch at all. And they go in there in February or March and cut down all the vegetation with string trimmers 
and they leave all the clippings laying on the ground. And this garden comes up through all those clippings. So there's this period in spring, in early spring, before the vegetation starts to grow, where it looks a little messy, it looks a little unsightly, with stems scattered all over the place. And if it's working at the Lurie Garden, which is one of the most showy, well-tended, and well-visited gardens in the world, I think it can work in our gardens too. Thank you. Um, Joanne asks, if your tree has a fungus on the leaves, can you still use the leaves for the mulch? We were told to get rid of all of them so the tree would not be reinfected the following year. Yeah, that's a, that's a bit of an issue um, because last year was a big year for anthracnose on oaks and hickories and uh, what else? A number of things had um, anthracnose, which is that um, it just made the leaves kind of ugly with holes in them and brown spots. Um, and so the recommendation is, yeah, when those leaves come down, rake them up and then remove them. Um, but it's, uh, it's virtually impossible to do that when you have a garden underneath it. We did not rake up any of the leaves that came down in our green mulch woodland. Um, they just sat on the ground and reinfected the plants the next year. Uh, the thing with anthracnose is that it's bad every 10 years. Um, we've had, this will be the third spring in a row when we've had quite a bit of rain, steady rainfall, which has encouraged a lot of fungal diseases like anthracnose. So we've had three bad years in a row, um, but I, and I know that there's some trends with more rain, um, but I know that um, it'll come back to a normal cycle in the coming years. And um, it's just one of those things that cycles out. Um, some years is a bad year for, for fungus, diseases and some years it's not. And anthracnose is not going to kill your trees. Absolutely not going to kill your trees. It's, it's purely cosmetic. Thank you. There's a couple questions related to soil. One is, do you recommend soil tests? And another question is, um, do you ever use compost tea or amend the soil with mycological agents? And you might explain to people what um, mycological is, if, for those who might not know. Okay, so there are two things there. Um, do we test the soil? The answer is no. We have the best soil in the wildflower garden that you could ever imagine. So we never do any testing in our, in our garden. But I know a lot of people um, talk about testing elsewhere. And I know a lot of gardens in our city um, are full of horrible clay soil. And so my answer to that is um, when you do a soil test, the results you get back say something like, for optimal production, um, which basically means to have the most flowers or the most fruits possible, put this amount of fertilizer down. And in my opinion, that recommendation is just overkill. We should not be gardening for maximum production of flowers and maximum production of anything. Um, the only time that fertilizer should ever be utilized is when you see problems with plants, when plants are yellow and stunted. Um, when you see a problem in the garden, that's when you should do a soil test. Uh, you sh I don't think that you should do soil tests any other time um, because we're using way too much fertilizer in our landscapes to begin with. Um, and so for the uh, mycorrhizae question, uh, we do add mycorrhizae. It's very difficult to add mycorrhizae to gardens because the stuff is pretty expensive. And so um, it's kind of hard to um, to spread mycorrhizae all over the garden. So what we do is we add mycorrhizae to our plants in production, in the containers. And so when we add mycorrhizae, when we're transplanting the seedlings in the greenhouse, uh, we, think, we, we think we see um, an increase in, um, in uh, health in the greenhouse and vigor. And we also think that once we plant those um, plants in the garden, um, the mycorrhizae that's colonizing in the pot starts to colonize into the ground as well. Um, so we're buying mycorrhizae from Mycobloom, which is a company in Kansas City, fantastic company that's acquiring local ecotype mycorrhizae, which means that those mycorrhizae spores came from the Midwest, they came from Missouri, they came from some Kansas, some in Illinois. And, um, and those mycorrhizae can really benefit our gardens. Thank you. Um, 
for Pennsylvania sedge lawn alternative, how dense was initial planting, that is plugs per foot, and how long until it looks as plush and seamless as it did in the example Scott showed? Uh, those are great questions. So a um, couple different ways to answer this. I'm gonna start out by talking about economics. Um, we, are, and some of our plantings are, we're growing, um, plugs in 73 trays. So that's 73 plugs per tray and they're very tiny plugs. They're about two and a half to three inches deep by about three quarters of an inch in diameter. And uh, we only grow plants for a short period of time in those plug trays. There are some nurseries that are producing plants in small plug trays. Um, um, oh my gosh, I'm blanking on, uh, sorry, what's the name of the um, Doug Bauer, John Wingo's company. Pure Air Natives or? Pure Air Natives. They're doing a lot with plug, pl plug production. Um, and so if you can acquire plugs from a nursery like this, they're going to be really cheap. They're going to be a little over a dollar and a quarter a piece. And when you do that, um, you can afford to plant on 10 or 12 inch spacing. Um, if you're using a standard two inch pot or two inch plug, the prices are gonna be a little bit higher, probably $2.75. You might need to plant 12 to 14 inches apart, you know, just thinking about economics. And um, I, if you're doing a really small area that's maybe only 10 or 20 square feet, then you could plant four inch pots and plant and still do it affordably on 12 inch centers. I would not go any closer, any further apart than, than 14 inches at the most. If you do 14 inches apart, it's going to take mm, probably two, possibly three growing seasons to fill in like you saw in the picture. If you do 10 inch spacing or 12 inch spacing with little tiny plugs, um, they will fill in, in in the second growing season. Great, thanks. Um, and you kind of already answered this question, but um, Thomas asks, planting every seven inches seems very close for some plants. Have you tested other spacing? And with, with what you just said, sounds like you, you have experiment or tested other. He says, New England aster becomes a giant in my garden and would take over the entire area. I think he means if planted that close. Uh, well, so what happens is uh, when New England aster gets planted on seven inch centers with um, 30 or 40 other species of plants, um, it gets crowded out pretty fast. And, um, and the other plants tend to keep it in check and make it much smaller than you would imagine. Um, when you put a, a New England aster in the ground and put mulch around it and have nothing growing within 24 inches of it, that New England aster will turn into a monster plant and grow huge. Um, but when you have competition um, so close together, there's competition under the ground with the roots, there's competition above ground uh, with the foliage. Plants really suffer, uh, they struggle. Kind of the way that uh, my wife's ki uh, siblings struggled at the dinner table when they were growing up. There were five, five of them. <laughs> And so uh, anyway, the other thing I wanted to say is that when we're doing these design plant communities um, and we have 20 or 30 species of plants growing um, in close proximity to one another, one of the maintenance things that we do is we go in in year one and we equalize the size of the vegetation. So New England aster is gonna take off and Culver's root is not gonna take off as vigorously. So we go in there with a pair of hedge trimmers and we cut back the New England aster stems so that they're equal to all of the other plants for the first year. So, um, so it's basically a trimming um, so that everybody gets the same amount of sunlight. Um, on a large scale, we do this with a mower. I basically go in there and mow everything six inches high or a string trimmer. But in a small scale, like in the photograph you saw, that's, uh, that area was um, uh, 12, 1400 square feet. We'll go in there and tiptoe through the plants and literally trim back everything that's, um, that's bigger than anything else. And so everything equalized, 
And um, that's, a, that's an important tip when you're doing a, a green mulch planting on seven inch centers. I know seven inches is kind of crazy, but you can, do, you can do 10 inches, you could try 12 inches. Um, but I think it can be affordable if you find those small plugs at a buck and a quarter. Um, don't quote me on that buck and a quarter, but I think it's close to a buck and a quarter um, for those tiny plugs. And the planting goes fast. Oh, great. Thank you. Um, Karen has a question. <clears throat> I think this is where maybe we're getting some confusion over the green mulch because I think it can mean two different things. But Karen asks, is green mulch the same as ground covers? If so, will the ground cover choke out, you know, the other sort of, you know, specimen native plants that you've planted? Yeah, so ground covers are green mulch. Um, basically, um, ground cover is plant material that covers the ground and it grows so densely. If it's a good ground cover, it's growing densely and it's eliminating um, germination of weed plants. If it's not a very good ground cover and not doing a very good job, it, it has gaps and openings um, where sunlight can get down to the soil and allow germination to happen and that can cause uh, lots of weeds to come in. Um, a good example of that is um, uh, uh, sadly, buffalo grass. Buffalo grass in most instances does not grow densely enough in a lawn setting um, to keep weeds out. Um, it has to have the exact perfect um, recommendations, at least in eastern Missouri, it has to have the exact um, conditions to grow densely enough to keep weeds out. In our area, I've tried buffalo grass lawns five or six times now, and every single time they've failed because weeds have crept in. It's not a very dense ground cover, and it doesn't do a very good job of, of shading the ground and keeping weeds from coming in. Um, a plant that does much better um, uh, is, is that Pennsylvania sedge. You saw that Pennsylvania sedge was very dense. Um, there were a few weeds, you, you may have noticed when I was showing the picture of me standing in it, you, there were a couple weeds in there, but the weeds are very few and it's very easy to manage because it's an extremely densely tight fitting uh, ground cover. So ground covers can be green mulch, um, diversity of plants growing, um, in a, in a sunny situation or a woodland situation can also be green mulch. It's basically plants growing very densely together. Thank you. Um, are you able to keep going with a few more questions, Scott, or do you need to leave? No, I'm fine. Okay, great. Well, um, Dean asks, would you recommend a couple different ground cover plants for a dry, sunny place that will grow among other things like butterfly milkweed without taking over the garden? Ah, oh, butterfly milkweed. So um, here's a situation where a clump forming plant might be a better choice than a, a rhizomatous plant. Um, and so when I say clump forming plants, I, I mean um, things like prairie drop seed, which is a clump former. It does not spread by rhizomes or underground roots. Um, I also think that um, star sedge, which is Carex radiata, is, a, is another really great clump forming um, grass-like plant. It's a sedge um, that grows in clumps and it does not um, colonize. And so uh, both of those grass, that grass and that sedge are low enough that um, butterfly milkweed can survive and, um, and hold its own against it. Um, I, I would keep the prairie drop seed at least 24 inches away from butterfly milkweed, give it enough elbow room to get um, big in size. Um, we did some butterfly milkweed mixed with prairie drop seed and we got them too close and the prairie drop seed won the battle. So give it some elbow room, but it's a, it's a, it's a nice plant in terms of height to use next to um, butterfly milkweed. And star sedge is even better because it's slightly shorter and, um, and slightly less aggressive. Thank you, and the star sedge does well in sun then too? It does, it does well in, in full sun. Okay, great. Yeah, Maureen had a similar question um, that violets won't work in full sun. What is a sun option? So it sounds like you, you're recommending um, the drop seed and the star sedge as two sort of green mulch, ground cover um, solutions for sun. Are there other, um, sun-loving uh, ground covers you would recommend? 
Yeah, there's a new one that um, that we've been using for the past four years. Uh, I think that um, some of the nurseries might be picking up on this, but um, uh, but there's a there's a prairie species of um, of groundsel, um, Senecio uh, platensis. Mm -hmm. uh, it's called Pacara now, Pacara platensis. Maybe I don't know the spelling on on that, but um, this prairie groundsel is an open sun species. It also grows on open sunny glades. It is a dry loving plant. Um, we have it growing in combination with, um, with lead plants in the garden and it is a beautiful combination on a dry sunny um, slope. So fairly well drained, really dry, um, out there in full sun and um, it is colonizing beautifully. It's a really nice surprise. Um, we're we're pleasantly surprised. It's not a plant that can tolerate moisture, so don't confuse it with Senecio aureus. Um, it's a plant that requires dry, well-drained soils, and then it colonizes very well. It's also evergreen, so it's, um, it's got that evergreen quality. So look for it. Not many nurseries have it, um, but um, if you start asking for it, you, you might find that some of the nurseries uh, will start to look for it too. And I know that, um, the specialty nursery, Missouri Wildflowers Nursery, um, has been has been propagating it. You might you might find it there. Um, Judy is asking which star sedge. Um, I, I know you said Curex radiata. Is there more than one sedge with that common name? Uh, no, but there are two sedges that are really similar, and that's a, I'm I'm glad you mentioned that. I almost forgot to say that Curex rosea is almost identical to Curex radiata. In fact, if you weren't a botanist, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between the two. Um, I had to have a botanist teach me, and um, I think honestly I've forgotten the difference already. Um, so, Rosia is another one that's in the nursery trade, or starting to become um, more common in the nursery trade. And um, so, if you find Carex rosia, it will be the same plant in height and form than um, Carex radiata. Uh, great. And let's see. Uh, oops, I just lost my questions. Um, which plants, again, do voles like to eat? I know you mentioned the blazing star of corms. Was there something else you uh, mentioned, Scott? Uh, I didn't mention anything, but they tend to like things in the aster family. So um, um, Bill Rupert showed me a root of um, joe pie weed that was munched um, by voles one winter. Um, I've also seen it on um, black-eyed Susans. Uh, so perennial black-eyed Susans will get eaten. Um, every single blazing star species gets eaten. Um, possibly aster and goldenrod, although I don't have any direct experience with that. It seems like they like the members of the aster family. Great. Um, question about, um, can I grow my own natives from seed? Yeah, uh, you'll score extra points from me if you grow your plants from seed. I think that's great. Um, I, I, when I grow plants from seed, it gives me an extra layer of satisfaction knowing that um, I've collected the plants myself and I have um, propagated them uh, in a windowsill or we have a greenhouse at work. so. Maybe, maybe not everybody has a greenhouse, but in your windowsill or in the spring, growing them in containers is very satisfying. Um, you can do it um, in the ground. You can collect seed um, and sow the seed in the ground in the fall and put a tag in the ground. And in spring, look at the second or third week of April for seedlings to germinate around that tag. Um, you don't wanna plant them too deeply um, but you do need them to be in, in contact with the soil. So sprinkle them on top of the soil in the fall and maybe cover them with just a very, very thin, like a quarter inch layer of um, fine ground leaf mulch, um, or just leave them sitting on, a, on the surface and over winter they'll, um, they'll wheel the way down into the soil and then germinate in the spring. Now you might have a hundred seedlings popping up in one spot, which is fine. You can dig them up and divide them and move them around your garden or put them in containers um, and share with your friends. 
Christine says, I have a first year plant, I have a first year prairie planting using the Mesic Prairie Mix from Missouri Wildflowers Nursery. I'm debating using my mower or weed whacker, but my mower's highest setting is five inches. Is that too short? No, that's not too short. You're lucky because most mowers co uh, go to three to four inches high. And I've done it with a three inch mowing and have had success with a three inch mow. So you do clip a little bit of the tops of the prairie plants off, but the main thing is to, um, to make sure that you get sunlight down to those prairie seedlings. And five inches is a-okay. Great. Liz says, I have a garden that is highly shaded and I'm struggling to find plants that will succeed in that garden. Do you have suggestions for species that are high shade tolerant? And I, I did share the front yard formal for shade but uh, sounds like Liz might be interested in some other plants, especially ones that are really shade tolerant, high shade tolerant. Um, I've, I've been involved with situations when there's, where there's extra shade and um, there's some situations that you can't grow anything under. Um, and just a couple examples. Um, in Webster Groves, there's, um, there's a bridge that um, goes over Elm Avenue. It's the intersection of Elm and, and I-44. And there's lights underneath that bridge and they have plants growing under the bridge, which they're very beautiful. Um, they're using a lot of electricity. Uh, I don't know how sustainable that is, but um, the reality is that you cannot grow plants in certain situations, in certain light situations. Um, I've seen tr people try to grow plants underneath high decks. So decks, um, maybe in the backyard, you've seen decks maybe that have been on the high side. And the further you get under the deck, plants just will not grow. Um, so there's that. Um, but I would say also that, that if you look into ferns, ferns tend to be a little bit more shade tolerant than, um, than a lot of flowering plants. And so if you were desperate, I would, I would start with something like um, sensitive fern. Uh, you might try ostrich fern. Um, you, um, those are the two easiest to grow ferns. You might try maidenhair fern. Um, I would try one at first. Don't put all your money in one basket. Um, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Buy a couple of them, see how they do. And if you're, you have success, then buy some more or propagate some more. Okay, thanks. Um... Deborah asks if you will do a presentation on woodland plantings. We have several acres of woodland on which we have walking trails and want to have natural looking woodland flowers and plants of interest. Um, of course, pe that she might be able to come to the Whitmire Wildflower Garden and see um, you know, the plants you have in the woodland uh, area, but have you done a woodland planting, Scott, or have any other suggestions for Deborah? Um. Yeah, I think I've done woodland woodland gardening talks in the past. Um, I probably have a half a dozen talks that are that subject. Um, I would. I think you were asking, would I do a talk like that? And the answer is yes. If you want to bring me back, I'd be happy to focus in on something else. Great, wonderful. Um, I just um, I'm bummed that I can't see your face and you can't see my face. We'll have to get that figured out next time. Um, and so I'm just thinking about resources. Um, I, I think that you can learn a lot by going to gardens and looking at the plants that um, are growing in shady conditions. Um, the Whitmire Wildflower Gardens uh, here at Shaw Nature Reserve has a lot of shady areas. And I think that you can get some great information just by walking around and taking notes. Um, we even have some gardens under walnut trees. So if you have a, a walnut problem, there are a lot of plants that do just fine under walnuts. Um, so maybe start by coming out, walking around, um, maybe find a garden close to where you live um, that is native and surely you'll find some shade to look at. Thank you. Stephanie asks, my asters get something on them every year. It is whitish and will it kill the asters if I don't trim them? What's wrong? Well, that's, um, that's a question that I am scratching my head on. I'm not sure what the white stuff is. Is it, uh, <clears throat> can I ask a question? 
Sure, I don't know if Stephanie's still on, but yeah, maybe she can type in something if she's still here. Um, is it a mildew? Or is it, um, or is it a weird growth, um, like, a, um, like an abnormal um, mass of, of leafy tissue? If it's, um, if it's a fungal problem, I don't know what to say. Um, I don't see a lot of fungal issues with our native asters. Um, they typically don't get um, um, leaf spots um, um, or leaf fungal leaf problems um, the same way that um, Monarda fistulosa, wild bergamot. That one can get a lot of fungal problems on the leaf. Those are little white splotches. Um, when it's a wet year, um, Phlox paniculata is another thing that can get leaf, uh, fungal leaf problems in a wet year. I will say that cultivars of asters and cultivars of garden phlox, um, there are hundreds and hundreds or thousands of them. And they come from other parts of the country. They come from other parts of the world. You can buy an aster. You can buy asters that are not even native to North America. Um, and when they come to North America, they come to your garden, um, they are prone to disease in a way that our local asters um, are not. And so I would, I would ask also, um, what aster is it that you're growing? And then we might be able to have a conversation about uh, local ecotypes versus non-local ecotypes. The local ecotypes are the plants that um, originated from this region and they're the ones that are going to be most disease resistant. Um, Stephanie does say that there are two native varieties and she thinks it's maybe mildew. Um, this is year three of um, the year of, of wet springs. Consistent wet springs lead to fungal problems. And it's a cycle. Um, it's, you know, next year it's probably not going to be as wet as this year. Well, watch me, watch, I'll be wrong, but... <laughs> We will have drought seasons again, um, you can guarantee it. And so it just happens to be a difficult year for, for fungal issues. It's, fungal problems don't kill plants. Asters, monarda, phlox, when they get fungal problems on the leaves, um, they're not damaged by it, it's really cosmetic. Thank you. Um, I think we might have to end here at 5.15, but there's just a couple more questions. Um, and well, there's actually quite a few more, but we might not get to them, but um, we will do our best to get um, answers uh, to, to the questions that we weren't able to address uh, this afternoon. Um, there is one here, Scott mentioned that there were many native plants that grow under or near walnut trees. Could you share a link or suggestion of where to find a list Maybe that could be another, a new top 10 list, maybe. Or maybe you have an, you already have a list, Scott. Um, yeah, Carol, I, I wrote a, an article, um, Gardening Under a Black Walnut Tree, um, that was published in the Gateway Gardener in St. Louis and also in the Kansas City Gardener okay. and elsewhere. And so if you do a search uh, for Gateway Gardener or Kansas City Gardener or um, Missouri Ruralist, you probably can find the article that, um, that I'm talking about. And um, I don't remember if we did a top 10 list, Carol, but if we didn't, we, um, we could certainly put one together. That would be great. Um, I am just searching for that to, uh, we will, we'll, uh, we'll provide that in the email that will go out uh, tomorrow. And oh my gosh, there's uh, oh Kurt. For those of you looking for um, shade plants, Kurt is suggesting Virginia bluebell, Saladin poppy. I'm sure Scott has many other um, suggestions as well. Yeah, don't forget purple coneflower is a, an open woodland plant in nature, and so it does really well in slightly shady gardens. Um, blooming at the same time as purple coneflower is skullcap, downy skullcap which is another um, plant that tolerates um, open shade. Um, and then also um, yellow wingstem, Verbicina helianthoides. Uh, all three of those plants bloom pretty much together and they complement each other very nicely. Michigan lily is another one that um, can tolerate um, slight shade and blooms at the same time. And also wild hydrangea 
all of those plants bloom at the same time. They are a knockout grown together and they all can tolerate um, a light shade or open woodland situation. Uh, oh, oh, just one more, because Tina has asked this twice now and I didn't get to it. What are the best companion plants with thimble weeds? For thimble weed, um, so that's um, anemone virginiana or virginica, I can't remember. And um, so that one blooms, um, I think it's a sort of a midsummer bloomer. And I'm trying to visualize what, uh, well, I, two things come to mind. Um, one is um, Coreopsis pubescens, which is star Coreopsis. That's a woodland species of Coreopsis, uh, shade lover. And, um, and it blooms for three months long. So it's gonna be blooming with the anemone. In fact, um, I think that the two of them were uh, growing in the same area where, where we originally collected the, um, the star Coreopsis down in um, Southwest Missouri. Um, the, other, uh, the other thing that comes to mind, um, shoot, I just blanked on it. Uh, oh, um, Texas Green Eyes. So Texas Green Eyes is another perennial that is native, grows in the prairie. And I found it growing um, at the edge of a prairie in Northwestern Arkansas, um, underneath a row of trees. So, and I know that we have it in the garden growing in a lot of different places and much of our garden has dappled sunlight and shade and um, Texas green eyes, which is Berlandiera texana, uh, blooms all summer. It starts blooming in, um, in May and it blooms all the way through October. It's an amazing bloomer. And so it will provide some, um, some color, some complement to the anemone. The anemone is a fairly tall plant. Texas green eyes is a little bit taller. And um, star coreopsis is about the same height as the thimble anemone. Um, Tina's asking when you say uh, uh, star, star coreopsis, she's re she says, do you mean star tick seeds? No, uh, no, not that. Star tick seed is coreopsis lanceolata. And that's a sun plant that grows on glades and prairies. Um, Coreopsis pubescens is a woodland species that has hairy leaves um, and it grows taller and it blooms in um, later in the season. So, so lance leaf Coreopsis or, or you know, Coreopsis lanceolata is blooming now and star Coreopsis won't be blooming for another month. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll just one last question, then we really should stop. Um, Robin says, um, I have a beautiful native garden that's being invaded by liriope. Please help. <laughs> <laughs> well, you saw that picture of the liriope that I used, and that is light liriope spicata, which is a highly aggressive suckering species. And so that, I'm guessing that's the one that you have because it's the most aggressive of all of them. Um, gosh, um, get a sharp shovel and start digging it out. <laughs> um, that's, uh, that's tough to do because it has a lot of roots. Um, and uh, if you leave a, a few roots, then it'll, it'll sprout back. So what I would recommend is um, maybe you can solarize it. Um, usually it grows in carpets, so if that's the case, um, you can solarize it with, um, with some of the same methods that I mentioned earlier. Um, mow it down, scalp it all the way down as far as you can, and then cover it with a piece of uh, rubber pond liner, which was what I use, or cover it with um, three sheets of newspaper and then mulch on top of that three inches deep. Um, or you can use cardboard instead of newspaper or solarize it with, um, with plastic and you just pin the plastic down. And I know that people use clear plastic, sometimes they use black plastic. Um, any kind of plastic you use is gonna, is gonna kill plants. Like I said though, when you use plastic, it kind of inhibits um, the micro uh, fauna that exists in the soil. And um, I prefer to encourage the micro fauna and the and the, and the worm things that are living under the soil. 
All right, thank you so much, uh, Scott, for being so generous with your time. Wonderful questions. Uh, thank you, Felicia and Brooke, uh, for all of your work to get this set up. And we will do our best to, if Scott um, has time, he's very busy um, at, the, at Shaw right now, but perhaps we can ask him um, some of the questions we didn't get to answer and we can get those sent out to you if, if Scott has time. So thanks everyone so much. And uh, we will um, get an email out tomorrow with some of these other resources for you. So everyone have a good night and happy gardening. Thanks again, Scott. You're welcome. Thanks for giving me this opportunity.